Sounds good? I hope so. Praise God. I think it's good. Listen, we don't plan these songs. And I mean, y'all had two songs about God's love in it. And uh, amazing love. Amen. I'm going to try not to sing this morning. Amazing love. Hallelujah. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me. I mean, listen, I mean, we can just shut, we can shut it all down. We can close the book and we can walk. We can have, say we had church. Amen. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me? What kind of king is that? You know, kings are born in palaces, and they they're wear silken clothing. And what kind of king is this that would be born in a major, riding into town on a donkey, hang naked on a cross, and die for his peasants? What kind of kingship is this? It, it comes from, it's otherworldly. I was reading behind a scholar the other day about some things having really to do with the love of God. And it, I always loved it out of 1 John 3, 1, and we'll talk about that a little bit this morning. But it's like the love of God and this king that was sent to earth is otherworldly. You understand what I'm saying? It's not of this earth. Because listen, I don't care how good you think your love is. I don't care how pure you think your motives are. Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The love of God is altogether different than what your love looks like, than what my love looks like. Lord, help us to love more like you. Amen. Jesus' love on the surface, man, it was selfless. It was sacrificial. Amen. So look, that's what my title is, God's love, what does it look like? So we're going to try to expose God's love out of the story of the Good Samaritan, all right? Y'all ready? We're about to read out of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. It says, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, he's talking to Jesus now, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I love this part right here. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Look at this. We're going to get a little glimpse into this guy's head right here. But wishing to justify himself... He said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him. The King James Version talks about the fact that they stole his clothes from him. They, he fell into the hands of thieves. They stole his clothes from him. They left him for naked. They stripped him. They beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, that's interesting right there. See, this is the NASB. It's also a literal translation, and I just want you to notice how it's worded a little different. I'll bring it up in the the future. Was going down on that road. I'm telling you, things matter, okay? You may not think it's a big deal when it's all said and done, but I'm telling you, you read perception matters. All right. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast And he brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord God. I pray that you this morning, Holy Spirit, would be welcome in this place, that you would be the preacher and the teacher, Lord, that you would just simply use me as a vessel, Lord, a mouthpiece to speak forth your truth. I pray that you would anoint the words that come forth, Lord. Your word is already anointed, but I pray that you would ride upon the words, Lord God, that are spoken and that you would allow them to penetrate the hearts of your people, Lord God, that it would effect change in each and every one of our lives, Lord, that we would be conformed into the image of our glorious Savior, 
that like the words of John the Baptist, we must decrease so that he might increase, that we would look less like us and more like you, Lord. We need your help, Holy Spirit. Do the work in us in Jesus' name. Amen. So listen, I love context, and there's a little bit of an immediate context. See, in the first verses that come before the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he, and he says in Luke 10, 1 through 11, and listen, if you read two different translations, some of them say 72, some of them say 70. Um, I don't want to get into all the nitty-gritty details on that, but listen, the number is connected to the nations. You understand? The division of the nations at the Tower of Babel, the number 70 is connected to the sons of Noah and the nations. That is powerful. That is important. Because, but, but look, so because God, God is redeeming this earth, God is taking back what the enemy desires to steal, and this geography belongs to God, you belong to God, and God is taking it back. And Jesus, he sends Jesus, and Jesus sends the disciples two by two, and he says, this is what's being said in the first, in verses one through 11, the harvest is plentiful, but there's few laborers. There's a plentiful harvest out there. Now, when we're talking about biblical New Testament harvest, it might have been different in the Old Testament, which was a type of the New Testament, because you see the children of Israel lived in an agrarian culture. So we see the feasts of the Feast of First Fruits, the, fe- the Feast of, you know, the, 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 other, all, the whole worship of God was connected to the feasts and festivals. But look, ultimately, those were just types and shadows of the great harvest that would come. The seed of the gospel is like seed that's planted in your heart, amen, It takes root inside of your heart, and it's going to produce a harvest. I got to tell you one day, the Lord, he is the Lord of the harvest. He said, I've come called some to sow, I've called some to water, but I am the Lord of the harvest. And there's coming a day when he's going to rapture his church. I don't know what your position on when, but I'm telling you it's going to happen. He's going to rapture his church, and there's going to be a great harvest because there's going to be a day when the harvest of the earth will be ripe and he's going to take his people with him and he's also going to send judgment on this earth for those that did not believe the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few you know there's a lot of people that love god but there's not a whole lot of people that are laboring for god i'm not trying to poke you in the eye i'm not trying to step on your toes i'm just trying to tell you the truth he's looking for laborers trust god he says this too he says trust god he will take care of you Look at this. Some will receive your message and others will not. Have you ever been rejected before? I don't really want to be a salesman. I did okay selling some roofs, and I'll still sell some roofs in the future if the Lord allows it to happen. But look, I'm going to be honest with you. I, don't really, I like showing up and punching a clock. I'm just being real because I don't really like rejection that much. But I did learn a lot in trying to be a salesman. And I learned, like, everybody ain't got to buy a roof from Matt. And it's okay. And guess what? There's many times that I'm sharing the gospel of, oh, I share the gospel a lot, my friend, by the grace of God. I share the gospel a lot. With every job that I have and everywhere that I go, when the Lord opens a door, I start talking about Jesus. But guess what? Sometimes people don't really want to hear what I'm saying. And, you know, I used to get so offended, man. Like just, you know, the enemy would cause irritation to rise up in me. How dare they reject my say? Listen, some are going to receive your message. Some are not. If the Lord lives on the inside of your heart and he's convinced you how real he is, you're just called, amen, to be a laborer in the field and to share that gospel with others. Amen? In the next few verses right here, this is the message. Some are, going to do, some are going to reject it. Some are going to receive it. But this is it. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. I love that word repent because it reminds me of that confession word, that homologia. But look, say the same thing. What does homologia mean? Hama or homo, same. I know that sounds weird, but that's Greek. Hama, same. Lagia, say. Say the same thing. Say the same thing as God. God's word says this. You can't say something different. When you confess your sins before God, you, according to the word of God and the spirit of God, say the same thing as God. Amen? Amen. Line up with the word. And when you repent, you change your mind. Hallelujah. Now, look, y'all don't 
I'm not trying to make y'all mad, but let me just say something here. When you repent and you change your mind, it's not just the stuff that you don't deal with no more. And in your superior spirituality, you look down your religious nose on other people and you're like, hmm, I saw what you did the other day. I see what you do. No, it's you repent from the things that are in the word of God that you're still dealing with, where you're still wrong, your rotten attitude, your gossiping tongue, your lying tongue, the things that are in your heart that are not right, that are against the will of God, you repent, you change your mind, and you turn from them, and you realize in your heart that you've been wrong against God. The judgment on the places that refuse the king's message is going to be unbearable. That's what the Lord said. Then the 70 returned joyful because demon spirits obeyed them. Amen. And Jesus' response was, rather, you should rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. But at the same time, I don't want to bypass this. You and I need to understand something. The Lord has given us authority over demon spirits. You hear what I'm trying to say? Jesus paid a high price so that you and I could walk in freedom and in liberty. It is not God's will for demon spirits to wreak havoc and influence the lives of believers. The world out there, listen to me, I'm not even going to start getting into psychological medications and psychological diagnoses. I'm not really, yeah, I kind of am, but I'm not. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that some of those things might be for the world. But I'm here to tell you right now, because guess what? If they're not going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit come live in this temple, then, then I'm just, I'm not trying to be mean. I know it seems like it, but give something to quiet it down. But listen, the Lord wants to come in and live on the inside, and he wants to set us free. I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says this morning. And I'm not talking about something that I just learned about. I'm telling you about something that I have experienced in my life. I was thinking about this the other day. I've been watching some different videos and some different things on some different teachings. And I realized that for the first 12 years of my Christian walk, I was under the influence of demonic spirits. Oh, I wanted to do right. You hear me? I wanted to do right. I wanted to live for God. But I was in a struggle. I was in a battle. You hear me? And they were telling, like, listen. I was being influenced, but when it broke, it broke. Nobody laid their hands on me. I mean, listen, there's, there's a, God's the deliverer, amen? But at the same time, that doesn't mean God will never use somebody to lay hands on you. That doesn't, but I, for me, it just the way it happened was people were praying for me, and, I, and God showed up in a barroom bathroom, do what you want with it, after 12 years of struggle, and the Lord showed up, and I'm telling you right now, he broke the bondage, and he opened my eyes, and I'm just so grateful that God loved me enough to not give up on me. Amen? But so I want you to know he's given us authority to trample on scorpions and serpents. And let me tell you why God wants you to have authority. It's not because, yes, you are special in the eyes of God, but it's because God wants his work to go forward. He wants laborers to walk in victory. He wants mouthpieces to speak forth the truth of the gospel for the kingdom of God because he wants new believers to be able to come in. Amen? That you're, do you know that you're called to be a representative of God? Do you know that you're called to be an evangelist? I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. I was sat in a church, a big church, a long time ago in Franklin that I was on the board. And, you know, I praise God that the pastor tried to preach a personal evangelism sermon. And he, but he actually said, I, I, I'm sorry. I just, it makes everything, it makes it so uncomfortable because people were squirming in their seat. Because he's like, I thought that was your job, preacher. You know, and I remember him saying that. He said, man, you can't, like, shrink me down and put me in your pocket. And then what you going to do, pull me, pull Pastor Brad out, put him on there, pour a little water, pacoop, and here he goes. He's all grown up, and he's ready to witness. No, it doesn't work that way. Moses said way back in the old days, whenever Joshua come a-running, he said, Eldad and me, Dad, they do prophesy in the camp. You got to stop them. Moses, he said, you do this for me? No, I would that all God's people would be filled with the Spirit of God and would prophesy for the Lord. It's your job, it's my job to be a prophet of the Lord. That's the Word of God. That's the New Testament truth. Amen? And not everybody's going to stand behind the pulpit, but the Lord will open doors for you. You don't have to try to do it the way I do it because ain't nobody really wants to hear that much anyway. I mean, every now and then I run across somebody like, wow, dude, that's, that's good. But for the most part, they're like, man, this dude's out of the box. <laughs> but, but you might have a different personality that you can reach other people. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. 
So now we get to the Good Samaritan, and I want you to see a couple of things. I want you to see these characters, all right? Because, listen, I I just feel like there's so much to this story, all right? There's a certain man, that's the King James, a a certain man came down from Jerusalem to Jericho. As a matter of fact, yeah, let's just keep going. A certain priest, these are the characters of our narrative story, a certain man, a certain priest, a certain Samaritan, a Levite, and a certain lawyer. He's not so much part of the story, but he's the one that causes the story to be told, right? The certain lawyer. So we're going to talk about him for a second. I want to climb up in this guy's head for a second. I want to try to figure out a little bit about what's going on. Some of this might be a little speculation, but the Word of God is telling us some things about this guy and what is going on and some things that we understand about lawyers. You know, I met a wife of a lawyer yesterday. I mean, it's not important who they were, but it's not the same kind of lawyer that you and I are used to. You need to understand that. This is different. The word lawyer is being used, but it's not the same like when you get into legal trouble and you got to go call up a lawyer to get you through your trouble or you sell a house and you, you got to have all these paperwork. That's not what this is talking about. So let's just look into this a little bit. Now, look at this. I I added this this morning. I couldn't sleep at about 4 o'clock. And I added this little picture because this was something that I had in my mind that as I was thinking about this lawyer guy because I've been knowing I was going to preach this message for a little bit. I remembered this movie that I saw one time about Shakespeare. And I remember in the movie that Shakespeare, they didn't, nobody knew who he was, but he had, he had like shelves of all these, at least this is how they depicted it in the movie, with all of these scrolls of paper, I guess of all of his writings. It was almost like a library. And then he would be feverishly grabbing these scrolls, going to his desk, and he'd have like a quill with, with, the, with the ink and, and the papyrus, and he's feverishly writing. And the ink, you know, you can about imagine, because I mean, if you've ever written or gone to school, school like I did. Sometimes it leaks on the paper before I really even knew how to use a computer and it'd be all over the back of my hand because that's what I would do. I write Even when I studied the Bible, I'd get like a piece of paper and I'd write and I'd write and I'd have ink all over my hand. And in the movie, I thought it was interesting. I'll never forget that. I probably saw that movie 10 years ago that, this, that Shakespeare has ink all over his fingers. And he's just, like, he's just like a madman pulling these papers and he's writing. That's how I imagine this guy. You, you see, and, and listen, this is a little one of them little Sunday school moments that we have sometimes in our church because we, don't, we need to learn some stuff. You're going to run into these guys in the New Testament when you read it. The scribes, the lawyers, the Pharisees. Now, I don't mean to break it down too deep, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees are part of what we call the Sanhedrin. They were the political leaders of Israel. But Israel was a theocracy meaning God was their leader, and these leaders were religious leaders, but they were also political leaders. But the, and so the Pharisees, just like, they, just like the, say, Senator so-and-so may have his own personal counsel that he has to get legal advice from before he makes certain decisions, these Pharisees would oftentimes go to these lawyers who were actually lawyers of the law of Moses. Does that make sense? So whenever the Pharisee needs to, well, well, what about that now? I mean, I knew some stuff. I went to school. I sat under Gamaliel, so I know a lot of stuff. But what about this particular thing? How are we going to split this hair, sir? And so the lawyer would be like, well, this is how we're going to split this hair. Well, many times lawyers had come from scribes previously. A scribe was one who just, a scrivener. He just sitting there copying manuscripts, copying works, writing, writing, writing. His fingers are probably full of ink, okay? But I'm just trying to tell you that many times a scribe would be promoted to a lawyer because not only did he copy stuff, he also learned stuff, and he became very astute in the law of God. Does that make sense? So basically what we're talking about here is this guy, this certain lawyer, he's an expert in the law. He's an expert in the law of Moses, right? And so he is listening to whatever Jesus is saying, and then he decides, and really and truly, he's challenging our Lord. You got to understand that. Yeah, have you ever, you know, sometimes people just, I think that I've been this way before and I don't want to be this way. Okay, I'm just being real with you. I just challenge anything and everybody. I mean, I'll confront stuff at the drop of a hat. I'll be super hypercritical. I'll, I'll think I know some stuff. I'll just listen to the first 
two words that come out of a person's mouth. I'm like, oh, that's wrong. I'm done. I'm turning you off, right, because I know better than you because you haven't studied as much as I have, and boop, off, you're done, okay? And so the problem with that attitude is is that you don't really have a teachable spirit. Your desire is to be right rather than to learn. If you don't have a teachable spirit and you don't have a humble spirit, you just get stuck. You get stuck in a rut. You're not going to agree with everything I say. I'm not going to agree with everything you say. But as a family of God, we should be able to grow together. And, and listen, let us sit down and discuss it. I'm not scared of that. Let us sit down and discuss. But we need to come to, we need to make sure that we're following following it according to the word, and we can dig it deep, or we can, you know, hey, look, it is what it is, right? Certain lawyer, expert in the law, this is what he says. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so the Lord says, I love it. The Lord flips it back on him. He says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? How does it read to you, Mr. Expert in the law, lawyer guy? How does the law read to you? You want to know how to have eternal life. What is the, can you sum it up for us? What do you think? And so this is his response. This is what he says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now listen, he's he's quoting right out of Leviticus. He's quoting right out of Leviticus, Old Testament law, the book of Leviticus. And what he's saying, where it says is, do not avenge a son of your brother. Instead, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's quoting that right out of Leviticus, right? And so that he's, he's giving it back to the Lord. And, and look, at, look at what it's saying. It's saying it's, the focal point is on God, right? I mean, if you love the Lord your God, and I believe that you people are like that. I mean, you wouldn't show up to this church. You would, you'd have other things you'd be doing if you didn't really want to love the Lord. Amen? Because we've already said it before. ain't no sense in playing church. There's other things we could be doing. Let's not play church. Let's, let's, let's be real with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay, listen, the, the soul, the mind, those are very closely interconnected, but he's like discriminating between them because your soul really is a part of your inner man that includes your mind and your heart. The heart is the emotion part of it. The mind has to do with your intellect, but it also is interconnected to your strength. He's basically saying give everything that is you, that makes you up. Sean would make Sean, Sean. Robert would make Robert, Robert. Hannah, Matt, whatever makes y'all, y'all. Give it all to the Lord. Love him with everything that's in you. And love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you love God the way that God wants you to love him, and if you get saved in the New Testament and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, listen to me, my friend. There's a whole lot of shaking that needs to be going on. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I love you the way Matt wants to love you, it ain't going to look the way that God wants me to love you. That's why it's called a fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. It's not a fruit of Matt. It has to be produced in me through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can do that because Jesus died on the cross. Hallelujah. He forgave Matt when Matt said, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the one. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. Won't you forgive me and come into my heart? And when that, whenever I said that, the Holy Spirit, I didn't have to understand it. And when I said it, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of my heart. Hallelujah. And now the Holy Spirit is contending with me. Now, I can, I can refuse to listen. I can, I can be rebellious. I can go my own way, right? And the Holy Spirit, the whole time, he's knocking. He's saying, man, man, won't you listen to me? Won't you repent? Won't you confess? Won't you say what I say and think what I think? But no, my flesh wants to live. Adam wants to live. Adam needs to die. I, Adam wants to live, and the flesh says, no, I got a right. I got a, I, I got a right to, to speak my mind. I, got a, I don't like the way that that sister came up to me after that teaching and said that little something. Good thing I didn't catch it till halfway home. I would have gave her an earful. I would have gave him an earful. You know, the Lord's like, son, I'm protecting you because you're about to make a fool of yourself. So I didn't even let you hear all that stuff because you think you're going to fix everybody, confront everybody like you're the big man on campus. No, I just need to just keep you calm because you're going to mess stuff up. All right. When you start to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then it becomes easy to start to love your neighbor as yourself. 
It's the work of the Holy Spirit doing it in you. Amen? He would, listen, that's one beautiful thing about the message of the cross, the message of New Testament theology, the finished work of Christ, whatever you want to call it, is that at some point in time, this truth is forced to start changing us. Because the essence of that message, whenever Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching or the message of the cross, the logos of the cross, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who believe, it is the what? The what? The power of God. Because the old man born of Adam dies, and the new man resurrects in Christ, and the new man, empowered by the resurrection power of the Holy Ghost, starts to look different, act different, speak different, respond differently. Amen? Amen. So that's how you got to love him right there. And Jesus says, you answered, he said to him, you have answered correctly. <laughs> you got it. Do this and live. That's it. Go on. But, but, you know, Jesus did that on purpose. He knew that something was really in this old boy's heart, right? He says, but he willing to justify himself. Isn't that some stuff? He willing to justify himself. So, he really wasn't, again, I'm trying to make a point. He just knew some stuff, and he felt like he needed to bring correction to the master. Can you imagine that? It's kind of like as, <laughs> I'm just saying, Luke's not really writing it real time, but as Luke's writing, you know, the words of the Lord, here's this lawyer like, no, you need to scratch that out. You need to put that there. You need to fix that. He's, he's like got his own thing going on. He's not really wanting to learn. So he wants to justify himself. And he says unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? So what is the Lord? Now, before we move on to the story, um, I wanted, to, I wanted to, to show you this. Now, this, this scripture is not really in any specific way connected to this story. I'm just trying to use this as a point because I believe that this lawyer of the law is full of knowledge and he's full of also he's full of pride. Okay, and so Paul writes to the, the letter to the Corinthians concerning food offered to idols. That's a whole nother subject, but I'm just trying to use this one little line here because it's still a principle connected to God's word. He says this, we all, all of us know this, and all of us possess knowledge. And this, this is what he says, this knowledge that we're talking about puffs up, but love builds up. Now, when you're talking about building up, the word is connected to edification. And edification is like building the inside of a house or, stru or erecting a structure, all right? And so what, what, he's, what he's trying to, Paul's trying to say is, is a lot of people got knowledge, but if you're not careful, knowledge will cause you to become puffed up. So knowledge has to be mixed with love. Okay, now listen, don't come around here saying, yeah, don't come around here with all this knowledge stuff, preacher. We want a new preacher because all you talk about is knowledge. Let me tell you something. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. So don't tell me there's not a place for knowledge in the Word of God. Amen? As a matter of fact, Proverbs is full of the knowledge of God. Because before knowledge, there is no wisdom, and before wisdom, there is no understanding. And without understanding, you cannot think like God, see like God, hear like God. Amen? But knowledge by itself, if it's not mixed with love, will puff you up instead of using you to build others up. You just take all your, your critical thinking, all your intellect, and you just start cutting people. <laughs> like leaving them bleeding on the side of the road. Oh, that's kind of like similar to our story. You just leave them bleeding on the side of the road, all right? So the essence of our story today is love God. And again, I was going to try to say, we don't plan these songs, but yet it's amazing love. <laughs> amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? All right, let's go back and let's take a look at the love of God played out in this story that Jesus tells. So well, before we do that, let's look at this word here, agape. You ever heard of that word? They say that's a God's kind of love, amen? There's a Greek scholar that I like to study behind. His name is Kenneth Weiss. I always like the definition that Kenneth Weiss used to describe agape love. So I'm going to go ahead and type it out for you real quick. Here it goes. The particular word for love here is agape. Now, this, this is deep, so y'all just bear with me. Which in the classics, now what is he talking about when he says that? You may, listen, do you need to know what I'm about to tell you today to be able to walk in victory with the Lord? No, you don't. But I'm trying to teach, I'm trying to explain something. Do you understand that the Greek language is called Koine Greek was already in existence before the New Testament was written? 
You might not have ever thought about that, but that's the kind of weird stuff I think about. When Alexander the Great came through in the great Grecian Empire and he defeated the Persian Empire, then guess what? He Hellenized the Western world. And what would Hellenization mean? Greek culture, Greek language, Greek influence on the people groups. What does that even matter? Because God was preparing the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole known world was speaking one language, and it was Greek. The Greek language was already in existence. There was already words in place when the New Testament writers began to write the New Testament. The New Testament writers took words that were already existing in Greek, and, they, and, and completely new flavor came into existence because it had fresh and rich meaning that was connected to God. All right. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that this Greek scholar says this particular word for love here is agape, which in the classics, talking about classical Greek, spoke of a love that would be called out of one's heart by the preciousness of the object love. I know that's a lot of words and I know it's deep, but hold on a second. I'm trying to make a point. This is talking about the preciousness of what God perceives as precious. See, now, that, now the New Testament writer, when he uses this word, he's not talking about the way that it was written by some Greek classical writer, whether it was, uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. He's not talking about those Greek philosophers right now. He's talking about the love of God and what God sees as precious. It's not talking about what you think is precious. You might think your kitty cat's precious, and I'm sure your kitty cat is precious. You know, sometimes I really think my dog's precious. Y'all might not think so, okay? Uh, you might think, oh, my gosh, this girl that I'm talking to, she's so precious. She might be precious. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is, is that in God's eyes and in God's mind, there's some things that are precious. And I need you to understand, you're precious. Hallelujah. Believe it or not, I'm precious in the eyes of God. And that's the kind of love that it is that out of God's heart, he sees how precious mankind is. And he sees mankind floundering in darkness and walking in the power under the bondage of sin. And he sends Jesus agape love. Hallelujah. To rescue you and I out of this mess that we were in. Preciousness, preciousness, you're precious. I want you to know that. If you don't remember anything else I say because I use so many words, remember that God sees you as precious. So precious. Listen, now, what does precious mean? I mean, I don't know. Precious stones, precious gems, precious metals. It has worth. It has great worth. How precious are you? I heard somebody, one preacher one time, I don't remember who it was, or I'd give him credit. You know how precious you are? You're, pre you're worth the value that somebody would pay for you. You hear what I'm trying to say? What is the value that was paid for you? The blood of Jesus, the life of Christ, the darling of heaven, the one that never failed. Could you imagine having a child that never failed, that only did what he saw his father do, only spoke what he heard his father speak, only did the will of his father? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? I know my kids would be like, yeah, Daddy, well, I wish you'd act like more like the father. <laughs> and then maybe I'd act more like a good child. Okay, and now look, kudos, touche. I'll, I'll receive my correction. All right, but preciousness. I just want you to know you're precious. You're precious in the eyes of God. To love God right, understand God's love. Amen? I just put that in there. I thought it sounded good. To love God right, understand God's love. Amen? So let's look at a couple of scriptures. John 3, 16. We're not going to turn to them, but real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How beautiful. How beautiful is that? Listen. God gave. He gave us a gift. Do you believe this story this morning? And I hope you do. I know for many of you, the Lord's living in your heart. You might still feel like you're not where you need to be. Guess what? Ain't none of us are where we need to be. Thank God we're not where we used to be. And we're moving forward in the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, the Lord will deliver you, set you free. Hallelujah. He'll do a work. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but instead would have everlasting life. Now, on this next one, I feel like I need to turn to it because it's really one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. 1 John 3, 1. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1. Let's, let's look at the King James Version first, okay? Let's look at that. Look at this. Behold what manner of love 
the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. The world can't understand you. Quit trying to get... Try, quit trying to get something from the world. Quit trying to get the world to accept you. I'm talking to myself right now, <laughs> in case you don't know. Let us quit trying to get the world to accept. They don't understand you. They don't know you. But listen, manner, what manner of love is this? If you look at a couple of different translations, this one here, this is the ESV. See what kind of love. That's actually better, okay? Or manner's fine, but it's an older English word. See the word, the NASB? It says, what great love. I'm telling you right now, I don't think that that's his right. This right here, ESV. See what kind of love. Again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's different love. It's actually, if you look up the word, if you look up, let me just, let me just do this for you real quick. We're just having a little Bible study in the midst of the sermon. Hold on a second. This word manner, what manner, from what country, nation, or tribe does this love come from? It's foreign. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? It comes from another tribe. Somebody walked up in the jungle to preach Jesus in Africa or the Amazon rainforest and busted up into a clearing in the jungle, and they said, I come to bring a love to you that you do not understand. It comes from a tribe across the ocean over there. No, it comes from another world, another realm. It comes from God in heaven. It's a whole different kind of love. It's a love that we really can't completely understand until, at least not until that love gets inside of our heart. Listen, this is, oh, oh, we're breaking down. Let me just tell you what the, what the scripture that was supposed to be there was supposed to be is Romans 5 and 8. And what Romans 5 and 8 says is this. For God commendeth, or other translations say, God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Listen to me. God's love is manifest with Jesus hanging naked on the cross. Hallelujah. He died for you. He died for me. Amen. Let's see where we go here. So here we're back to our story. So let's go ahead and get into the story a little bit. We kind of exhausted the certain lawyer. We got into his head a little bit. We realized he was kind of puffed up, full of knowledge. He was just trying to be right. He wasn't really... He wasn't really concerned about what was right. He was just trying to be right, okay? And Lord, help us all because Lord knows we've all fallen into that trap, or at least I can be the leader in that. So let's start off with the story. We're not going to talk about this certain lawyer. We're going to talk about this certain man. The Bible says a certain man, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, went down to Jericho from Jerusalem. Now look, geographically, if you look at a map, it's not having to do with south versus north. Jerusalem is built up in elevation. You know, some of y'all have heard me talk about that before. Now, this is important to the story. You remember in the story where Paul said, and I'm kind of shooting from the hip here, four times was I whipped, five times was I beaten with rod, left shipwrecked and naked in peril, left naked in the cold. See, this kind of stuff happened because, look, you got to understand, Jerusalem was built in elevation, but it was, it was, so it was basically up on a mountain. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, okay? So Jerusalem's built up on a mountain. The city of Jerusalem's on a mountain, and it's also a very rocky terrain. And so robbers and thieves would hide in the cracks and wait for people like this certain man to come down. And so people are coming down, and then they fall amongst these thieves. That's what happened to the apostle Paul when he says, I was left naked, beaten and left naked in the cold. So, I mean, that's pretty embarrassing, right? I mean, you get up, and you're like, okay, well, I got to keep on going on for the Lord, you know, and I show up down in Jericho now, and I'm naked, <laughs> I need some clothes. And the reason why is, is because clothing was expensive. People just rip the clothes right off your back and leave you naked. Like, yeah, I know I got a closet, dude, that's embarrassing. Like, I, 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 I'm clearing them out. Like, I need to get rid of some of this stuff. Uh, but anyway, whatever I don't sell, I don't even know if anybody's even my size. I give you my stuff, and it's all name brand stuff. But guess what? I need to clear this stuff out. It's ridiculous. I can only wear so many pairs of clothing in, a, in like, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, let me just keep going. Certain man coming down from Jerusalem, going down to Jericho, descending in elevation, and then he gets caught up in the midst of robbers. They steal his clothes, they leave him naked, and they beat him and leave him half dead. So then, all of a sudden, a certain priest comes along. Now, look, 
The priest, you got to understand that, listen, you also hear about a Levite here in a second. You understand that the priests come from the tribe of Levi. Okay, what does that even mean? Another Sunday school moment here for a quick second. I'm shooting from the hip again, but if I'm not mistaken, Levi was the third son of Jacob and Leah. Way back, like 2000 B.C. Jacob and Leah's third son was what? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then Judah. All right, Levi's the third son. Hundreds of years later, after the Egyptian bondage and the release on Passover night, the the Levitical priesthood would be created in the wilderness when God gave the law. So all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Moses and Aaron and Miriam were all descended from the tribe of Levi. But Aaron was a high priest. So from that time moving forward, all the descendants of Aaron were priests, and the Levites helped with all the things having to do with the tabernacle. So the main thing I wanted you to see is that this priest theoretically might have had an argument when he was walking by because the law says, I believe it's Numbers 19, the law says if you touch a dead man, you're unclean for seven days. So if we're going to give him the benefit of the doubt, if he was on his way to do service, if he touched a dead man, I mean, the guy looks half dead. He looks like he's dead. So we're trying to give this guy benefit of the doubt. Then he would not be able to serve in the temple for at least a week. But the problem is he also was coming down from Jerusalem. So what does that mean? He's already provided his service. And he just looks over there and says, I ain't want to get involved in that, my friend. He left, he's, he's over there bleeding and he's dying on the side of the road. And this, this priest will not stop because he's scared he's going to be made unclean. I mean, a yeah, hypocrite. Thank you, sister. Help us, Lord. I mean, how many people smell bad? How many people look bad? Lord, help us. All right? I mean, how many times have we had to pray? I don't know about you, but I prayed. I'm like, Lord, change my heart. Even if they smell bad, sometimes I don't smell that good. You know? I try not to. Lord, help us. Amen. A certain priest, it is hot. And it doesn't help that I go run at lunch. And all the nurses are like, dude, what are you thinking and what are you doing? You're running at lunchtime in 110 degree weather. Anyway, that's another story for another time. Certain priest, but look, the Levite. So then a Levite comes along. Now, you know, the idea is, is that the priest he shunned him, and so you and, and we tried to give him an excuse because he didn't want to be unclean so that he could serve the Lord in the temple, but we already, de- we already debunked that thought. And now the Levite, like, he has less to be worried about. I mean, he, still got, he could still be made unclean if he touches a dead body, but theoretically, he should be able to help. What does he do? He just keeps on walking, right? And then, a good, and then here comes the certain Samaritan. The good Samaritan. Now, we talked a little bit about it last week, but the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And so Jesus is doing so many things on so many levels with this story that we can't even really exhaust it because he's really, who is my neighbor? I'll tell you who your neighbor is. Your neighbor's the guy that you don't want to touch. But the one that you judging, he's the, probably the one that's going to help him. And so in reality, look, shame on us. Shame on you, church. Shame on me. If the Catholics outserve us, if the Mormons outserve us, if the Jehovah's Witnesses outserve us. And listen, I ain't going to be scared to you. I'm going to tell you like it is. Listen, I was listening to one preacher this morning, and look, can I tell you something? The Mormon, the Mormon religion is a lie. Jesus is not brother with Satan, my friend. The Jehovah's Witnesses are lying. Jesus did not, is not the manifestation of the archangel Michael, my friend. Okay, uh, you know, and we could go on and on and on and on and on. And, but reality is, is that out there in the real world, unfortunately, they knocking on doors and they helping people more than sometimes people in the church are physically. Now, they, they, they doing all of that and they're espousing their false doctrine and they're causing trouble. Nevertheless, Jesus says this good Samaritan. Now, what did this good Samaritan do? I mean, he went over there and he helped him. Not only did he touch him, but he poured in the oil and the wine. If I could sing, I would sing an old Pentecostal song that says, They poured in the oil and the wine, the kind that restoreth my soul. He found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho road, and he poured in the oil and the wine. 
Amen? He poured in the oil and the wine. See, Jesus is the good Samaritan. But you know, when I was thinking, or when I woke up early this morning and I was thinking about this story, I was like, I've been thinking about this story for I don't know how long now, and it just hit me for the first time in my life <laughs> that this man was naked on the side of the road. Have you ever heard of another person or another people having their clothing stolen from them and being stuck naked somewhere in the midst of their shame. And immediately I thought to myself, man, this looks like Adam and Eve right here. This looks like Adam and Eve right here. Have you ever heard of a thief stealing the clothing of somebody leaving them open to the air, naked and ashamed to the point where they hide behind a tree from the very presence of God? Oh, but they didn't have no clothes to begin with. Let me tell you something. Scholars would agree. Some, they were clothed with something, my friend, because they didn't even realize that they were naked before. And, and listen, if you go from there and you do a thematic search from the time that Adam and Eve realized they naked, you see clothing after clothing, whether it's fig leaves or animal skins, it's a type of Christ, whether it's moving into being clothed. Now that you've been baptized into Christ, you have put him on, meaning you've been clothed in Christ in the New Testament to all the way to the end when you're going to be clothed in garments of white linen because it's the righteousness that Jesus has provided for you. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the thief left Adam and Eve naked. Maybe I'm taking some liberty, but I tell you, it sounds good to me. The thief left Adam and Eve naked in the garden. This man is left naked and bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. And the good Samaritan, Jesus, comes along. And he pours in the oil and the wine, the kind that restores a soul. I'm here to tell you that's the gospel message this morning. The world has been left naked, bleeding, and dying. The minute you think that sin is fun, the minute you think it's going to taste good, smell good, and it's going to feel good for about a week. And then the next thing you know, you're going to wake up. Or maybe not even that long, maybe 15 seconds. And then you're going to, be, you're going to realize at some point in time that you're a slave. I know I told you all this story before, but one time I was jogging at night. probably told you all five times. <laughs> and uh, I was jogging at night on one side of the road, and they had like three, four teenagers, a girl and three boys, and one, one of the dudes was wearing a long trench coat. And I was jogging on the side of the road, and I said, nope, not tonight. So I went over there, and I said, hey, listen, I know this is so weird. Some complete stranger jogging on the side of the road just rolled up on you, and he's got a word to t say to you. I don't know where you are, what you're doing, but I'm here to tell you, at one time I was just like you. And I'm telling you right now, right now, sin seems fun. But sin, and one day you're going to wake up and you're going to realize you're a slave. But I got good news for you. When you wake up and you realize you're a slave, his name is Jesus. Call on his name because he will set you free. Y'all have a good night. And I went back to the other side and I kept running. I want you to know this, is that this, this is what sin has done to the human race. You and I might think that it's fun. You and I, we can even pretend, oh, man, God ain't real, dude. I done got so smart. I don't need God anymore. Science has proven God ain't. Listen to me. Scientists are liars. Science is a lie. If it's trying to denounce Jesus, it's lying. If it's denouncing the word of God, it's lying. True scientists, you know what they're starting to realize? They're starting to believe in intelligent design. Intelligent design. How you know? I'm going to tell you how you know, because it, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Sean knows this. Sean knows just something simple like the Krebs cycle. I, don't, I, I know I keep talking about that. What is the Krebs cycle? It's something we had to learn in nursing school, in a little basic organic chemistry. They learned it in a manual, too, where you, where you cleave off, uh, if I'm not mistaken, carbon atoms, and that you put glucose into the tank just like you put gasoline. I'm talking about at the cellular level. At every little cell in your body, energy is being produced. You put glucose in the body, and you start tearing off all of these uh, atoms that are taking place and something called ATP is produced, energy. At the cellular level, all of the cells in your body are acting like little bitty combustible engines. You put glucose in just like you put gas in the tank. Energy is produced. The body moves forward. Listen, your brain 
tells your ear to hear and all this, all these cells in your auditory are, are making all kind of stuff happen and all of a sudden a signal comes back to your brain and tells you to hear. My brain tells my, tells my, my hand to reach over here and pick up this iPad and all kind of ATP is being produced right now in my body as I'm moving and I'm talking to you. All kind of energy is being produced. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Just something that simple. When I have an anatomy professor that does not believe in God, I'm like, oh, my goodness. How much deception are you under, sir, that you're sitting here teaching the miraculous human body, and you think two cells bumped together and jumped out of a mud hole, and then now, all of a sudden, this Krebs cycle thing is going on. No, true scientists are realizing they may not want to believe in God yet, but they're coming to the realization, no, there's something intelligent that made all this stuff. This stuff is too well put together, even in the midst of the fall, to say that they ain't something happening. Okay, I can tell you what it is, sir. It's Jesus. It's God the Father, and he's got a plan. Hallelujah. Jesus is upholding all this with the word of his mouth. Amen. Anyway, let's get back to the story. A certain Samaritan, he's found bleeding and dying, and he's on the Jericho Road. Listen, I'm closing my message with this. Musicians, I don't know if we have any left. If we have some musicians left, let's just come on up here. Because listen, I want us to have some time, some opportunity, if y'all want to come up for prayer, amen, to spend some time at the altar if you want to. I want the altars to be open. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to feel like you're, you're in gross sin to come to the altar. You know that? Just because somebody comes to the altar, you know, people, oh, I can't go to the altar. People are going to think that they're going to judge me. They're going to think I'm full of sin. No, man, the altar is a place where you get a hold of the horn of the altar, man. You get a hold of God, amen. Praise God. So I just want you to know that, man. We can come to the altar. I'm going to get uh, Brother Kurt, Sister Brenda to come up here and pray. I mean, other people, if y'all want to come pray for others, if you just want to come up here and get in presence of the Lord, I say we go out of this place worshiping God and asking God to minister. But look, I just want to close with this. He poured in the oil and the wine. How many scriptures are there that talk about the oil of the presence of God? Hallelujah. Listen, 1 John 2.20 in the King James says you have an unction. ESV and NASB say you have an anointing from the Holy One. That word in the Greek is charisma. It means to be, it's where we get the word charisma. It's where it means to be smeared with oil. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The wine, listen, how, how, we know what the wine is. It's a type of the blood. Amen? They, they drank the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood was, was shed so that you and I could be healed. We might be just like that man that's bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road, but I got good news for you. Jesus shed his blood so that you could be healed, and the refreshing of the Holy Spirit like oil can bring healing to the wounds of your life, to the things that you've been through. Won't you worship the Lord with me? Amen. Listen, if you need prayer as they lead us in worship, y'all come up and let's pray together. Let's seek the face of God together. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.